Hello and welcome to Illumination Archaeology. Last week I said that this week's video would be about paleoarchaeology and human evolution. Upon reflection, I realized that that is way too big a topic to talk about in one video, so I will be splitting it into three. This week's is about paleoarchaeology goals and methods, but keep an eye out for the future two-parter on human evolution. Last week, I described paleoarchaeology as the study of ancient human populations. The truth is that paleoarchaeology doesn't have a set definition, but is most often associated with paleoanthropology, the study of fossil hominids. The Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History's Human Origins Project Online prefers the term paleoanthropology and defines it as the study of human evolution. While paleoanthropology seems to be the more official term, paleoarchaeology is used more frequently in the literature that I read within the field of archaeology. It seems likely that paleoarchaeology refers specifically to the archaeological study of paleoanthropology, that is, the branches of evidence for human evolution having to do with excavating fossil hominids in their context, rather than with genetics or behavior. Please note that the paleo part of paleoarchaeology and paleoanthropology can be spelled in two ways, P-A-L-E-O or P-A-L-A-E-O, if you like having extra vowels. So we know that the goal of paleoanthropology is to explore the process of human evolution. How do paleoanthropologists do this? Paleoarchaeologists look at a variety of evidence from the ancient human past. Most importantly, they look at ancient hominid fossils. From these, they can learn about human adaptations to different environments and towards the traits that make us uniquely human today. Paleoarchaeologists also study a variety of artifacts and fossils that show that hominid activity has taken place in the past. One example is fossil footprints. From the size of the footprint, the distribution of weight shown by the depth of the footprint in different areas, and the distance the footprints are apart, we can learn estimates of height, weight, and gait of the humans who made the footprints, as well as aspects of the environment based on how soft the ground was at the time of the footprints and what other fossil footprints and plant imprints are found. Paleoarchaeologists also find ancient stone tools. The first stone tools date to over 3 million years ago, predating the earliest members of the Homo genus. Stone tools teach us about human cognitive abilities, how they made things, how they lived and interacted with their surroundings, and how they evolved over time. Other early human tools are made of organic materials such as antler, bone, wood, vines, and other plant material that did not preserve well in the archaeological record. Occasionally tools of this sort alone or attached to stone tools will be found in exceptionally preservative circumstances. We can also learn about early human diet from animal and plant remains. Paleoarchaeologists are especially interested in bones with cut marks on them that show how early humans were hunting and butchering their food. In addition to their dietary habits, we're interested in other habits of early human beings. One is craft production, seen most clearly in stone tools, but from about 20,000 years ago also in pottery, and from various periods in more organic remains. We can also learn about their migration habits from the places that we find their sites, the seasonality of the dietary remains we find there, and any items they could have used in transportation or storage, especially pottery. We can learn about cooking and housing habits, again from pottery, but also from hearths, the remains of fires, as well as from the remains of shelters. Many of the things that ancient humans used to make clothing came from plants or animals and do not preserve well in the archaeological record, but we do have some of the tools made of bones, antlers, and stones that they used for making these clothes, such as awls and needles. We also have some of the earliest evidence for human art, personal adornment, and music, including animal and human figurines, beads, pipes, rock art, and other decorated objects. In addition to the evidence for human belief found in their art, we have the evidence found in their burials. Many ancient human burials appear to be purposeful and include objects that show respect for the dead or beliefs in the afterlife. In addition to this extensive paleoarchaeological data, there's other paleoanthropological data that we use to infer what ancient human ancestors may have been like. One is primate behavior. By looking at our closest primate relatives, especially chimpanzees and bonobos, who are the most closely related to us, we can learn about the traits that we have in common and the traits that developed after we branched off from them. Some of the traits that chimpanzees and bonobos share with us are occasionally walking on two legs, using tools, uh, an elaborate and caring social life, and even warfare. Another form of information comes from genetics. 
As we learn more about the human genome, we can match specific genes to specific traits. When this is not possible, we can use genetics to discover how long ago two species of an evolutionary line branched apart from one another. Paleoarchaeology is often a very difficult area of study. It has a lot of limitations. Because the events of interest occurred so long ago, many of their remains have often deteriorated. In addition, human populations and group sizes were much smaller in the past, ensuring that they leave fewer remains and much more widely distributed over the landscape, especially since they were more migratory and they used more organic materials, which would not have preserved as well. The long period of time since these remains were deposited also means that their environments have changed, that animals, plants, human activities, and the shifting of the earth has moved the artifacts around, and that different aspects of these materials, especially chemical ones, may have changed, making them harder to interpret. Often the result of all these disruptive forces is that paleoarchaeologists will find very few pieces of evidence together. The type of evidence they are most interested in is ancient human remains, but these are often in the form of a single skull, a single jawbone, or a single limb bone. This may be enough to identify a new species, but it doesn't tell us very much about their populations, about how other aspects of their bodies were evolving, or about how they related to their environment. Since fossils and non-organic materials are most likely to survive taponomic and preservation processes, paleoarchaeologists work with a lot of bones and stones. A paleoarchaeologist has to be aware of all these limitations so that they can be incorporated into interpretations of the remains that they find. Despite these difficulties, paleoarchaeological research is ongoing. One of the most exciting recent finds was a new species of fossil hominid, Homo naledi. Although chemical dating has not yet been done for these fossils, researchers believe that they fall somewhere between Australopithecines, a much earlier branch of the human line, and Homo erectus. Next week I'll discuss primate evolution all the way up to the great apes. Don't forget to like, share, comment, and subscribe. I'd especially love to hear questions or topic suggestions for future videos. Thanks for watching, go out and illuminate. What's up everyone? Stop. Yeah.